Welcome to the daily video update. This is being prepared Wednesday, June 8th, where we'll look at the action in the market today and then see how things look for Thursday, June 9th. You might notice that I'm calling this the executive summary. I'm trying another idea. For those of you that have been watching the videos for a while, I did a snapshot video just to give you a short overview of what's happening in the market without going into a lot of detail. That didn't seem to go over so well. I went back to doing the full length daily video updates. Now I'm going to try another idea where I just go through the different things that are happening and charts that I see are actually telling us something without going through each and every chart. The idea behind this is to do an executive summary. Hopefully the video will be shorter and hopefully they will take me less time to produce and upload and then one or two times or on an as needed basis then I go back and do a full-blown daily video update so please let me know what you think of this see if you like this idea if you don't like it if there are things you feel I could change please let me know how you feel when I start off with this video I go over what I call market notes and these will go over what happened on Wednesday the areas that are in blue show that I have a chart that I'll go through and back up what I'm saying. But one thing that we noticed is that oil crossed above 120. Lumber has been declining for most of 2022. And that's a chart that I do look at every day, but I haven't shown in a long time. We've really been going down. Gold is still above its 200-day moving average. And because it's in white, I don't have a chart for that. The NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100 remain above their monthly pivot. Interest rates continue to climb. The 10-year and the 5-year are back to being even. They both have the same yield now. The 30-year yield is breaking above a FIB level, and I have a chart to show you of that. Gas prices are what everybody is still talking about as it goes up and up. Fear is high, but not necessarily extreme right now. The OECD, which is a global unit, and they look at the whole globe economically, they came out on Wednesday and they cut their global GDP view to 3%, where it had been 4.5%, and they also raised the inflation outlook. Now, you might think they're a little behind the curve, and sometimes these folks are, but they came out and made an official statement anyway. The Atlanta Fed, which puts out a thing called a GDP Now model, their estimate for the second quarter, which is what we're in right now, was lowered to 0.9%, where it had been 1.3%. Another thing that happened internationally was the Reserve Bank in India, they raised their lending rate 50 basis points to 4.9%. Well, just like what happened in Australia yesterday, the market's were caught off guard by that. They expected a 40 basis point increase. The economic reports that we had were pretty lean on Wednesday. The mortgage application index, it was down another 6.5% on a week over week basis. Also within this report showed a 7% decline in purchase applications and a 6% decline in refinancing applications. So this is really impacting the housing market. The other report that came out showed that wholesale inventories increased 2.2% on a month-over-month -month basis. They expected it to be at 2.1%, so that was a little bit more than they expected. Now on this chart, I just go through what I'm seeing in the S&P 500. The S&P was down 1.8% on below average volume. 10 out of the 11 sectors were negative. The only one that was positive was energy, and it was up less than a quarter of a percent. The equity put call ratio, it actually declined on a down day, which is kind of strange. The VIX, and I don't have a chart of the VIXEN, declined on a down day. That's also kind of strange. Prices have moved to the bottom of the recent short-term trading range that we've been in. We've been bouncing for the last number of days, and now we're at the lower end of that range. The Swinlin Trading Oscillator, it advanced on a down day, and it also advanced yesterday. So this sometimes can be a leading indicator for us. The S&P is still above 
both of the 20 period moving averages. The rate of change looking back 10 periods, it's no longer extreme. We also have the PMOs that are rising. That's no longer extreme, but I do have a chart of the rate of change 10. The elder, based on the S&P 500 and the SPY trading system, is back to neutral. The momentum oscillators, they're all still positive. The short and intermediate term stochastics are still extreme positive. The new highs and new lows moving averages are still rising. The bullish percent index or BPI is holding up. It declined a little bit, but just a tick on the chart. The go no go system has turned more negative, and I'll show you that on a chart. Prices fell below the short term fib level that I'm starting to show you, but we're still above the intermediate and long term fib levels. The staple spike is still looking viable. As far as our trend, the ADX is negative and it's non trending because we're below 20. The bias I'm keeping now at mixed to more negative, and the momentum is also mixed right now with more of a negative slant, even though I didn't put that on here. So let's go back and look through some of the charts that I am using in this video. Fear is at 36 now. We're right in the middle of the fear range. Another chart that I got from Isabel Net shows the net bullish sentiment both with retail and institutional investors against the S&P 500. If you look up here, the blue line is the S&P. And this is when the rate hikes started and we've been having some trouble. Well, we're coming off a reading that's pretty negative. And this just shows that it, there was a lot of fear in the markets and there's a lot of different things that happened. This goes all the way back to 2005. But it's just showing that we're coming off of that reading. So that could be positive for the markets since we just had an extreme negative reading. Another chart that I found as I was going through MarketWatch, and I'll try to include this chart, but I don't know if they have this every day. It's a risk on, risk off gauge. And right now, overall, we're at 51%. We're slightly leaning more towards the risk on stage. And then you have all the different components down here. If they're red, that's more of a risk off stance. If they're green, that's more of a risk on stance. But mostly what we look at is right here on the top. The VIX actually declined a little bit, even though we were down. But you can see we're in this range that we've been in for a number of days now. The bar chart also shows we're declining a little bit overall. So that's kind of strange. Usually on a down day, especially over a percent like we were, we would see the VIX go up, but that didn't happen. Equity put calls, you would also see that expect to rise, but they declined on the one day chart and we're still showing a decline on the five period moving average chart. The Chicago National Financial Conditions Index came out and we are going up showing that things are a little more concerning, but we're still below the black line overall. Gas is just going up and up and up to the moon, 4.22 now. Looking through Yardeni's morning update, where what we're seeing, especially in the discretionary sector, is they're lowering the forward earnings per share, and that excludes the automotive industry, where this is the red line. And this just shows the earnings estimates for all of the different sectors that make up the S&P 500. But since we're seeing a lot more weakness in this area, that's what he pointed out on this chart. Another thing that you can kind of go, yeah, okay, it helps. But I don't like these kinds of measurements. Some people really get into them. It just shows that late June is when stocks tend to weaken. And this goes from 1950 to 2021. The beginning part of June is generally more positive than when we get to late June. It just shows that we have a tendency to go negative. That's when people really get set to go on their vacations. It's right before the 4th of July. We're really turning into the summertime at that point. The reason I don't like this is, okay, this might tell us what has a tendency to happen, but we need more concrete things to look at. What really is happening? Just as an example, a few years ago, 
we usually slow down quite a bit in August. We were going through some really difficult times and August ended up being just a roller coaster of a month with a lot of volume and a lot of price movement activity. So just because that's typically what happens doesn't mean that's always what will happen. And so I'm a little bit leery of these kinds of studies on a personal level. Another thing is just the probabilities of the U.S. economy entering a recession. Do you think we'll enter one in 2022? There's about a 10% chance based on this study put out by Morgan Stanley. In the first half of 2023, they're giving it about a 20% chance. Same thing with the second half. The first half of 2024, it's back down to a 10-10 split throughout the year. And no recession by the end of 2024 is still in the lead at about 30%. These folks like to try to project things into the future and forecast what they think will happen. And sometimes we can find that useful because a lot of people base their decisions on these types of studies. Another thing is just a different look at the advanced decline line. This is the S&P on the top where we saw a higher high back in November where we saw a lower high. Now this is a variation on the advanced decline line. This is the top 15 most active stocks. And then are they advancing or are they declining? I couldn't find an actual list of what are the 15 most active stocks. If we look above this, especially on the downline, where we were seeing a positive divergence with the advanced decline line, we're seeing more of a double bottom here. And right now, according to this, we are at pretty key resistance. So what would I read into this? Not really all that much without knowing what 15 stocks make this up. And it might change because what's active today may not be active tomorrow. So I'm not sure what the logistics are that go in to make up this bottom advanced decline line. This next chart just shows the equity inflows have slowed, but no sustained outflows yet. When we drop below zero, that means more money's going out. Yes, less money has been going in based on this study, but we're still positive overall. The purple line here is the ISM manufacturing, and inflows and outflows have a tendency to really follow what the ISM manufacturing report shows. Another chart put out by Citi is the U.S. Inflation Surprise Index. A few days ago, I showed the economic surprise index when the reports come out. This just shows when a report comes out, did it freak everybody out because it had high inflation? Well, in May, we had a reading of 42.97. It had really spiked up, but has since been coming back down. This is giving rise to the scenario that maybe inflation has topped and starting to roll over. Another thing that came out on Wednesday was the GDP Now model that's put out by the Atlanta Fed, they changed their estimate. They had been saying that GDP for the second quarter was going to be at 1.3%. Well, based on this model, they came out and said, nope, it's going to be 0.9%. Looking at our interest rate scenario and what I'm trying to figure out as far as what it's telling us, this is the chart that kind of started everything for me. The blue line is the Fed funds rate. And that's set by the Fed at their FOMC meetings. Also realize that they can change those settings at any time. We have some kind of a catastrophe or some big economic thing happens. They can go in and raise or lower these rates outside of their scheduled meeting times. Just as an example, back at 9-11, when that happened, the markets were closed for a week. The Fed met during that time and they lowered interest rates a full percentage point. But that got lost in the news with everything else that was going on at that time. The yellow line here is the two-year yield, and that's what we're really starting to watch. And we're seeing a real separation between the two. This just means that the Fed is behind the curve. They should have interest rates up to here if they want to stick closer to the yellow line. And then something's going to need to happen. Either this yellow line is going to have to come down, which means two-year yields drop, or the Fed is going to have to raise interest rates or a combination of the two. And that hasn't happened yet. Looking at the spread between the two, this is updated on a daily basis where the red line is the two-year yield and it went up. Where the Fed funds rate, it's staying at the same. Even though it fluctuates overnight, 
it doesn't have that big of a change and we're just showing a really wide gap between the two. We're also looking at the correlation between the S&P 500 and the two-year yield. They are having a positive relationship right now, but it did decrease slightly. Interest rates actually ended up going up on Wednesday where the S&P declined. So that's why we see a little bit of a tick down here. Doesn't mean they can't coexist. We just need to watch really three variables all at the same time. Is the S&P going up or down? Is the two-year yield going up or down? And we also want to keep an eye on the P.E. ratios overall. Is the market getting more expensive or less expensive? And I'm also looking at the euro dollar futures because they tend to follow very closely to the Fed funds rate. Looking at the intraday chart, didn't have all that exciting of an open. It was negative based on Tuesday's close, but we came down a little bit. And really, it looked like we were just going to have a sideways day. Didn't look like anything interesting was really happening. As the day went on, we ended up dropping below the daily pivot. We came almost down to S1, went sideways, and just finished there. So even though it was a down day and we were down over a percent, there wasn't a lot of price movement within the day. Here's the daily chart. This is just showing the range that we've been in, just chomping up and down. On a positive note, we're still above the longer term support and above the monthly pivot. On a negative note, we're just camped out here and not really going anywhere, which is great if you're doing sideways strategies that take advantage of time decay. We do have overhead resistance above us if we start to go up. And looking down below, volume really dropped off on Wednesday and is well below average. Here's the ADX, which is still kind of a mess. It's showing the black line is under 20, so that means we're not in a trend. The red line is still on top, even though it's decreasing, because the green line is also decreasing. We are still above the 20-period moving averages. The rate of change, it had been giving us an extreme positive reading. It's dropped back down. Now, stochastics. The short term are still pegged positive. Intermediate term, pegged positive. Long term, still continue to show improvement. The Swinland Trading Oscillator, this actually bumped up based on price and volume on a down day. Sometimes this has been a leading indicator for us. The Elders, looking at the SPY, it's back to neutral. It's also neutral for the SPX, as well as the Diamonds and the Qs, which I'll show you in a minute. The Go No Go system has gone back to a more solid, darker purple bar now, so that's more negative. The short-term FIB levels just going back to the high that we set in March to the low that was set in May. We've now dropped below the 38.2% retracement level with the S&P 500, but we've been bouncing above and below that for many days now. On a longer-term basis, it looked like we might have been breaking through this longer-term FIB level. Well, now we've dropped down below that. And here's the diamonds just showing that they are neutral, as are the Qs, when we have the blue bars. The dollar bounced up almost a quarter of a percent on Wednesday, so we're still in an overall uptrend, even though we're well off of this spike that we've been seeing. And this is the scenario that we're looking for now. We spiked up in May. We're coming back down. Are we going to continue to fall, or will the dollar get some legs and be able to go back up? Other times when we saw spikes ended up leading to some pretty severe weakness in the dollar. Oil up over 120. We're at 122.11 now. And these are other times when oil really spiked, such as World War I. We had the Israeli-Arab War, one of many that have occurred over the decades. Where we saw things spike, we had the oil shocks of the 1970s the dot-com bubble, the financial meltdown, and then where we are at right now. So we're just keeping an eye on these things. Lumber. I haven't shown this in a while, where it's just been going up and down and up and down and all over. Well, for most of 2022, even though commodities have been going higher, lumber has been really decreasing. At the beginning of the year, lumber was up around 1350 or so. We've dropped now down to 573. 
So if you want to go out and build a treehouse, run down to Home Depot and you should get lumber for less. This is the 30-year yield, and it just shows that we're starting to break above 3%, which is above this 50% Fibonacci retracement. Our possible positive scenarios, the two-year yield, is it spiking? No, not really, because we went up with the two-year yield. And plus, we're trying to see how this fits into some of the other things that we've uncovered with all of this. So this is not looking necessarily viable right now. Small caps are another thing we're keeping a close eye on. We're on a relative basis. The small caps are still outperforming the S&P, even though it did decline. You can see where we're seeing a little bit of a spike up in the ratio, which might give the S&P some power to move higher. The staple spike is still looking viable. Even though the S&P was down and staples were down, we're seeing this dropping overall. So this does look like a legitimate spike right now. As I've been saying, we just need to break out of this range that we've been in to really be able to shoot higher. Some of you might be interested in emerging markets, and it's a very popular ETF. It's the EEM, and I have a chart that I will show you. What's interesting about this is the blue line here is the MSCI and how it's been declining for 2022. The dark blue line is the dollar inverted. And it's really interesting to see how the dollar and the emerging markets ETF tend to trade in an inverse relationship. That goes beyond the things that I tend to cover, but I still keep an eye on this anyway. So here's the Emerging Markets ETF, where it has been in a real decline. It was up half a percent, but overall, are we going to be able to see this really move back up if we see continued weakness in the dollar? Just to tell you a little bit more about that ETF, the top countries are listed right here. I also go through this in the course that I teach, where if you want any exposure to some of these other countries, this ETF can help you do that. And here are the top 10 holdings as well. And this can shift over a period of time as it gets rebalanced. I'm not going to read all these off to you, but you can pause this and go, oh yeah, I've always wanted to get into Alibaba or some other company here. I don't know how to pronounce their name, but I sure like them. Then I'm putting the technical overview more at the end when I do these types of videos. And nothing's changed here. The things that were positive before continue to be positive now. So I don't need to really read these off to you if you watch these videos on a consistent basis. Those things that are negative continue to be negative overall as well. So nothing has really changed. You've got a market that's really indecisive right now. So what's our outlook then? The technicals, yeah, they're weakening because we had a down day, but they're also holding up at the same time. We're really in a mixed environment right now. Sentiment remains mostly negative. We have the growth and value battle that continues to go back and forth. The economic reports. We do have the European Central Banks. They're going to be making a policy decision. Normally, that wouldn't be that big of a deal to the U.S. markets. But because of this environment that we're in, the markets are going to be paying attention to that. And then we have jobless claims coming out on Thursday. Friday is going to be the big economic report day. Then all the different geopolitical events, which could shift things either positive or negative. And it's the same list that I've been rattling off now for quite a while. So what are our scenarios? I've switched this from down to neutral. And the things that have been causing us to go down could still continue to have us go down, such as all the different geopolitical events, the trend of selling into strength, the rising two-year yield especially if it's out of proportion with P.E. ratios and with the S&P. With technicals, they're still negative, but showing some improvement. What could help us go up from here? Technicals are improving, and we still have sentiment, which is quite negative. But it's shifting back more to neutral now. The possible positive scenarios. We still have valid signals with the Copic Curve, the Pring Bottom Fissure. They've given us signals, as has the Mass Index. The staple spike, that's looking the strongest right now. 
Two-year yields have not topped yet, and we're not seeing much of a Fed pivot from a hawkish stance to more of a dovish stance. Technicals, as far as the pivot levels, short-term moving averages, Fib retracements, and previous other levels that we've hit may provide either support or resistance. And yes, we are now in a sideways trend because the ADX is below 20 and the negative side is winning out currently. So our conclusion then is the S&P is mixed, just kind of like everybody is right now. Short term, it's improving in spite of recent declines. Intermediate term, it's negative, but it might be improving. Long term, we are still negative overall. So thank you. Let me know what you think of this other format, what I can change, what I might have to shift around in the order, what I should have included that I didn't, what I did include that I shouldn't, and so forth. So have a really good Thursday, and we'll look forward to possibly an exciting Friday.